then is much more on the um, rather curious discrepancy that I found. You spoke about the European Union effort in the case of Iran. You spoke about the European Union effort in the case of Palestine and Israel. There was no mention of the European Union in the case of Iraq. Now, we all know why this is the case. Uh, and I don't think that the British government is necessarily responsible for it. But can you actually um, say that you can envisage a coherent European Union role uh, in the case of Iran, with Germany having the same view of the situation as us, and for instance the French? Or do you think that the Iraqi situation is a particular case where there is no consensus and on almost any other issue there would be a uh, European consensus about how to deal with the crisis? Well, I think the, the difference, if you like, in the nuance and the approach there was mainly a, a difference of the reality of the circumstances of both cases. I don't believe that you can compare Iraq with Iraq. Uh, for very obvious reasons, uh, the invasion of, of a sovereign country, the weapons of mass destruction, the use of them by uh, the leadership in Iraq has uh, forced the attention of the whole world through the United Nations, uh, through the internal members of the Security Council, through sanctions, through military intervention uh, a few years ago, through a military presence nowadays. That has all been very much high profile on a global scale in the case of Iraq. And therefore, in relative terms, of course, the role of the European Union is somewhat less than it is in another area where the United Nations are not so directly involved. That is the case of Iran. Um, I'm very glad, uh, and I hope that most people at this conference are, that the uh, presidency of the European Union by the United Kingdom and the role in particular of the Prime Minister has not allowed the debate to be dominated by purely internal European Union mechanisms. We've been obsessed by questions of uh, economic and monetary union and single currency and restructuring and agricultural policies. And I think that, uh, quite frankly, since we took over the presidency, uh, most observers would recognise that, uh, that certainly the Prime Minister and the, Europe, uh, and the United Kingdom government have attempted to turn the European Union's views slightly more outward, uh, particularly over the issue of Iran and the relationship, and also which I'm quite proud to concentrate their mind on the question of the Palestinians, because the, the question of the Palestinians is not on its own, not just on its own, intrinsically an extremely important question, but it also affects the whole of the region. We saw that uh, only a few months ago, where the response to Iraq's refusal to carry out the resolution of the United Nations, the response to that was to some extent coloured by people's perceptions of what was happening elsewhere in the region, particularly in Palestine. And therefore, I, I, uh, I think the nuance of difference that I placed on that was a correct, um, a correct emphasis, and I think reflects the priorities given to what the European Union can best do in terms of effort uh, by the EU and by the United Kingdom government and presidency of it. And I think that is best addressed towards our relationships with Iran, encouraging, and not uncritical, but encouraging developments there, uh, towards bringing together with the aim of some move forward in the peace process uh, the governments uh, of Israel and President Arafat in London. Okay, I have five people who have caught my eye already. Um, we have about ten minutes left, so um, I think already I have to ask you to make it very snappy. Well, I should certainly be very brief. My name is Michael Howard, and I am the Conservative Party spokesman on foreign affairs. And I want to take this opportunity very briefly to emphasize to everyone present this morning that the policy of this country towards the Gulf is a bipartisan policy. This was uh, implicitly and indeed explicitly recognized both by the Secretary of State and by Dr. Reed. Uh, in the last government, we were very proud of the closeness 
of our relationship with the states of the Gulf. Uh, we made great progress in improving uh, that relationship and reinforcing it. And we have been watching very carefully to see how the new government performed uh, in this area. And uh, the fact that uh, they have, in general, continued our policy does not, of course, relieve us of our democratic duty to scrutinize the way in which they perform. Uh, we have been, and we shall continue to scrutinize the extent to which they do honor the commitments that we have for a long time had to security in the Gulf. And we shall be scrutinizing with particular care the outcome of the strategic defense review in order to ensure that it will enable this country to continue to honor those commitments. Uh, but in general, as we approach the anniversary uh, of uh, the last election, uh, and at a time when verdicts on the government's performance are being given uh, generally, uh, I think it's right for me in this gathering to say uh, that our verdict on the the new government's performance in relation to uh, the Gulf and our commitments to the Gulf is so far so good. Uh, Mike Hilton, uh, former Secretary of State of Defence. I'd like to thank the Minister for his uh, gracious remark uh, towards me, uh, the last Minister of State. Uh, I want to go back to the uh, subject of the first question. Uh, I was very struck by the Minister's distinction between UK policy and European uh, Union policy. At uh, one point, he mentioned gratitude towards those countries that had supported UK policy. Uh, as I recall, that would not have included probably a majority of countries within the European Union. And yet the European Union is moving forward towards a common foreign security policy, which is endorsed and carried forward by the Treaty of Amsterdam, which this government has signed, and is envisaged that such a policy can be arrived at by qualified majority voting. So my question to the Ministry is very simple. Given the differences that there have been between the United Kingdom and European neighbours, is he looking forward to a European common foreign and security policy determined by qualified majority voting? I genuinely believe that uh, in the general area of defence, we learn from some of the mistakes in the past made by our party. As a strategic uh, position, I think it everything we can do to develop a consensus on national security is in the national interest and therefore wherever possible that we should subsume party politics within the general national interest on matters of national security and I think that is developing. It does not mean that any party to such discussions within the United Kingdom uh, should suddenly become mute or dumb or deaf or in hot or in bondage to the other. Criticism, uh, critical analysis, hopefully constructive criticism, is the lifeblood of democratic uh, Britain. Uh, but I do think that, uh, you know, I welcome the point that you make, and I am more than happy to uh, bear witness to our appreciation, particularly as regards the leadership uh, during the, 19, uh, the early 1990s in the Gulf of the previous administration. And I think that uh, uh, we certainly have no intention of changing that for the sake of changing it, uh, nor we have any intention of changing it at all. Uh, to take the uh, very simple question asked by uh, Michael, the former Secretary of State of Defence, it is absolutely true that the United Kingdom has through its various treaties, not least by Mr. Thatcher signing the Maastricht Treaty, committed itself in the long run to a common defence policy uh, and a common defence. Uh, in the long run, of course, is always very difficult to find. It's a bit like how long is a piece of string. If you are asking me if in the foreseeable future I look forward to the United to the European Union deciding Britain's defence policy, the answer is no. Because no one envisages that. We have made absolutely plain that the cornerstone of our policy, of our defence policy, is the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, uh, proven by history, forged in the fire, uh, extremely uh, effective in terms of its operation, coherent, we believe, in terms of its strategy. 
Uh, within that, of course, we do want to develop a European security and defence identity. Uh, we do that in a number of ways, primarily through the Western European Union, but we have, as you will know, had discussions uh, as to how the European Union, where it has an interest on these matters, uh, may be informed and internal and internally inform the Western European Union over matters such as the peacekeeping in Europe, St. Peter Park's tasks, and does not hand control or command or authority on the Western European Union in NATO. I'd like to ask John Reid how he sees um, the role of Britain and Europe in all of this. You see, the sadness is, if the role that I was very appreciative of Tony Blair going and obviously trying to take up, is merely a subsidiary one to the Americans. Whatever we people may say, the idea that the Americans are even handed between Israel and the Arab world is not actually the case. And Netanyahu believes he can get away with the things he gets away with, because in the end, the Americans are always slapping with the inside of the glove, the suspension continues. So there is no equality in the American view, whatever they may say, between um, Israel and the Arab world. There is a role, surely, then, for Europe in being a genuine honest broker, and if you like, addressing something about the imbalance that there is in American attitudes. One memory, and uh, I won't go on any longer, but one memory from my time at the Foreign Office, where I had a certain in, in, in very controversial involvement in these issues, was that there was only one thing during that period that manifestly troubled the government of Mr. Shamir, uh, which was in his way, uh, yeah, well, as bad as Netanyahu, or well, I should say Netanyahu in his way, they're as bad as Shamir. And that was the suggestion that the European Parliament would withhold the trade concessions that are vital to Israel in the event that Israel failed to comply properly with decent and acceptable human rights standards in the West Bank and in Gaza. Quite frankly, that is a very potent weapon. If we are to become engaged in the peace process, please let it be on the basis that we are, as Europe, an independent entity. If we're just Straggling along behind the Americans, like you know, Winnie the Pooh being dragged up to bed behind Christopher Robin. That won't actually do any good. Two, two points I think arising from what you say. The first is um, the recognition, and I, I'm glad to, um, to reinforce that, that there has been a continuum of policy and a coming together and a sharing between Her Majesty's loyal opposition <coughs> and the government on the uh, questions of the Gulf and indeed I think increasingly of, of the Middle East and the area as a whole and I think that's welcome. Uh, we have tried to illustrate at an early stage and on a number of occasions, even the first year of government, uh, by signals and by discussions uh, how much uh, we, uh, what importance we place in that relationship and in particular uh, the Secretary of State of Defence and also our Gilbert, John Gilbert has uh, not only kept closely in touch with these issues, but has made several visits uh, to the region, and I think that that, uh, that has eased any fear that there might have been of, of a radical shift in policy. Now, as far as the uh, as the role of the United Kingdom, either and so on for the European Union is concerned, yes, I do think not only that, that we have something to offer there, but that we have shown that we're willing to offer it. I suppose the question you asked is, what should the posture of the United Kingdom be? I think the posture should be to make plain, as the Prime Minister did, uh, to the parties in the Middle East and to the wider community, that we stand ready to assist. I think that we, have, we are pursuing a policy which is a careful balance by saying openly, we are willing to help, but avoiding uh, any implications of the old colonialists in any way intervening because this party, this can only be solved by the parties to the dispute um, and I think that the good faith of the manner in which we have done it uh, has been accepted by the, uh, particularly by the, the keenest nearness for President Arafat uh, to take up the general offer in a specific uh, fashion by uh, coming to London. Uh, this is why I think the European Union is also totally helpful because, as you point out, it's a large and not insignificant group of people with political, with economic muscle. I don't think you'd expect them to respond to the specific demand that I create government policy uh, at this conference uh, in a fairly radical fashion. 
But I think we recognize that it is important uh, as a political and as an economic force in the world, separate from and independent from other economic and political forces in the world. And I think that therefore Britain can both offer itself, if it is wished by the parties to this dispute, as a friend to facilitate agreement rather than to proactively intervene and try to provide a solution. And secondly, through a widening of the interest and role and assistance of the European dimension, uh, we can add something to what we can personally do ourselves. <coughs> I was a Conservative member of Parliament for 28 years. I'm chairman of the Middle East, um, Middle East International and um, joint chairman of the Kuwait British Friendship Society, which um, reminds me of the pleasure of seeing Sheikh Salman here today and the years in 1967 when we worked very closely together on the issue which never goes away from the Middle East, which is the request of the peace settlement. Uh, David Miller was a bit of a bus. Um, I agree with what he said, and my question <clears throat> would really follow on from that. Um, peace is indivisible. Uh, United Nations resolutions should not be selective. Quite right <coughs> what we did over Iraq. There are, of course, United Nations resolutions in connection with Israeli withdrawal from our territory. If the conference, which takes place in London, is going to have any chance of succeeding, some of the key issues must be addressed. And what I would like to ask the Minister, <clears throat> because obviously there must be a British, not just um, hospitality, but participation in the British conference, are we going to raise the question of settlements on West Bank? Because in fact, if settlements continue to expand, then the chance of United Nations resolutions being adhered to and territory for peace being the basis of that is simply not going to take place and there will be no progress. I think that we have made a position clear in terms of our keenness to increase the assistance given by the United Kingdom and the European Union. Uh, we will host the conference. I'm sure we will try to facilitate agreement on these matters, but I don't necessarily think either that it is better for us to be setting a list of demands and advice from the British government as host, or uh, even more from my career, for me to be telling you here what Mr. Blair ought to be doing. Uh, there are some of these matters which I think are better perhaps not dealt with by public declarations of expectation before the parties arrive. I think if we set ourselves a more modest task of bringing the parties together in a more constructive fashion than they previously have uh, shown themselves to be uh, in some quarters, that that will be a step forward. And of course if the parties uh, wish to use any further uh, British influence uh, to facilitate solutions, I'm sure that that will be available, but I don't think that we ought to uh, be setting up a wish list of public uh, demands from the United Kingdom uh, before the parties arrive. My question is related a little more uh, to defence issues. Uh, if the obligation, <coughs> historical, cultural obligations of friendship, in some cases obligations of treaty, between the United Kingdom and the Gulf states are to be observed. Is it not inevitable that the United Kingdom, as a result of its defense review, will have to adopt what is now commonly described as an expeditionary strategy? Yes, well, I think that uh, without telling you the conclusions of the defense review minutes, uh, first of all, thank you for, for the support you have over the years of defence, myself personally and wider, uh, and I think you're absolutely right uh, that uh, is developing uh, a critical uh, attitude in the House of Commons, but one which seeks to establish some general framework of security, which is 
benefit uh, to us all. I think as regards to your specific question, yes, I would think that one of the themes that is emerging from a, a defence review is, and I use the phrase, the crisis coming, uh, us going to the crisis rather than the crisis coming to us, that in the much more complex world that we face, where the one or two big threats have been replaced by a multitude of risks, uh, where flexibility, mobility, speed and reach are uh, uh, now criteria which must be taken even more seriously, that the ability to project force or to involve ourselves in expeditionary warfare is much more important now than it was, say, a decade ago. Uh, and that if that is to be adopted, it has certain implications for our force configuration. That the, if we are truly going to lead from a foreign policy analysis through to the force configuration, uh, then we, that obviously has implications for them, that we have to be able to get there, but not only to get there quickly, get there quickly with the right forces and to sustain them there. Now I don't suggest for a minute that this is a revolutionary attitude. It isn't a break with the past and I was happy to pay credit to Nick Souls and to Michael Portillo who developed the, the first uh, beginnings of the Joint Rapid Deployment Force and so on. And I think we've got more time to think it through in many ways uh, and I think that we could expect or look forward to a development of that along the lines that you say. I would like to thank the Minister for his government support in regard to the peace process, and I would urge the UK to continue to develop its role further. I think we all think it's very crucial uh, to the continuing stability and security of the Gulf. Uh, my question to the Minister, though, is on Iran. Now, although the attitude or the view seems to be quite favourable uh, in the Minister's eyes at the moment, when he says that policies there are only a few policies that might be disturbing. It is argued that a lot of the politicians, a lot of the disturbing politicians, are still around. People like Khamenei, Nath uh, Nouri, General Zakat Masharifi, a lot of very strict, reputable, very dangerous men. Now, I would like to get the Minister's view uh, on the stability of the Khatami uh, government at this moment, and how sustainable are these benevolent policies that are being pursued at the moment, considering the political realities that exist within Iran at the moment, and its strategic uh, position in the Gulf today in regards to the islands that are occupied, and in regard to its support of ter terrorism uh, that it continues to do so uh, as we speak today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I hope that I didn't present uh, Iran and what I had to say is my idea of an enlightened, stable, democratic society. If I gave you that impression, it perhaps is my Scottish accent <laughs> failed to get it through. Uh, what I was, I, I think, saying is that we are better than we were a year ago in our perception of Iran. There are signs. Uh, which are at the moment not indicative of a complete change, but of some progress being made, that we would not be right in ignoring those and painting a completely blank picture or in any way showing that we were refusing to accept that these signs existed, because I think we would be quite rightly accused of a predilection or a prejudice against the, uh, Iran. However, I completely agree with uh, the points that you made. I think we would be naive to mistake what are early signs for a wholesale transformation of the situation, or to ignore the fact that uh, many, the most of the key players who uh, last year worried us were still there, uh, and therefore to take this as is a step, the first step on a long journey, uh, which we will take in the spirit, uh, in, in the most liberal but not naive spirit, 
and test uh, or question or seek further steps down that line over the question of support for international terrorism, stability in the area, a view towards the neighbours, uh, and so on. So I wouldn't, I don't think there's a great difference between what you said and uh, what I said in a different accent. <laughs>